cold front met the warm front, and the air tore until a cone of violets swirled over the lawn of the town suite's retirement home. Inside, the folks were in their apartments, and the nurses were in their break rooms, and the kitchen staff in the kitchen. And outside, the sky grew midnight in the afternoon. It had been 80 years since a tornado touched down an estuary. When the warning sirens blared, only a few residents in permanent care could place the sound. That is, if they could hear it over blaring TVs and dementia screams. The command came from the management to the nurse stations. Tornado warning. Alert residents. Retirees to tornado shelter. Invalids away from windows. Confusion arose then. Where was the shelter? How many residents could relocate on their own? How many needed assistance? Arguments broke out among the staff, and the residents sat the moment of destruction watching TVs of perky smiles selling them what they didn't need. Folks looked out windows, said, well, it's awful dark, isn't it? Then all the windows shattered. The tornado touched down on the roof of the east wing like the fat purple finger of God. Elderly women doing wheelchair calisthenics to instructional DVDs were lacerated by gusts of 114 mile per hour winds in the glass shards they carried. Veterans of nameless war sat in their handicapped bathrooms, unfazed because of well-timed bowel movements and low batteries in their hearing aids. An illiterate dishwasher pushed eight residents playing euchre in the cafe under the tables, saving lives but breaking femurs in the process. As quickly as the tornado struck, within a minute it had moved north towards Auburn Road, and another five it was gone. In the aftermath, residents were screaming and bleeding and broken, while others just laughed raspy at the unexpected commotion. The staff worked through the night. The next morning, the management took a sobering tally. 36 residents had been sent to the hospital for cuts and fractures. One woman died of related complications. However, the email rationalized, she was from permanent care. What the email did not say was that four residents had disappeared. Three were from the assisted living wing. Two women and a man. All could walk independently, though they only left the facility once or twice a year. There were activities inside. The fourth was from the permanent care ward. Unlike the assisted living, with its hidden nurses and lavender air diffusers, the permanent care ward smelled like antiseptic feces and Clorox bile, swarming with the white and blue uniforms of underpaid Caribbean women. The missing woman spent her days vegetating before TV static in a gurney, clutching to her ribs a baby doll which had no hair because she had chewed it off. The staff checked maintenance rooms, closets, bathrooms, and anywhere they could think for the missing residents. Meanwhile, the management committee discussed how to handle relaying the delicate information. The concern was lawsuits from enraged families, bad publicity, low New Year enrollment. Every choice invited loss of profit. Delayed by fruitless meetings, days passed, but oddly, the issue never seemed to arise. The missing were not missed. The residents were used to their friends simply not showing up to cards or breakfast one morning, so they did not question the disappearances. The families simply never bothered to check. Ultimately, the management committee decided to say nothing. The police were not called, nor the families. The hope was the missing would simply show up. It took a week, but someone called about the man from assisted living. It was a doctor. The man had missed an appointment. Shortly after, as though summoned, the man's body was found. The cafeteria ran out of butter packets, and when the cross-eyed busboy checked the industrial freezer, he found the man's corpse had frozen blue. His heavy eyes were open, fuzzy with frost and an unnerving white stare. They thawed the man and caught his daughter, telling her, mostly accurate, that he had died in his sleep. The two missing women from assisted living were friends, having bonded after their husbands passed. Everyone figured if they ever showed up, they'd show up together, which was exactly what happened. A day after the pastor inquired about two missing regulars at a Sunday service, the town suites received a call from a local housewife. 
Her dogs had been fighting in an overgrown corner of her yard, yipping and growling and coming back reeking of rot. She suspected a dead rabbit until one of the dogs returned with a finger in his mouth. He had swallowed the woman's wedding band. Given the way their bodies were bent, the coroner figured the twister had picked the women up and tossed them, then crash, quarter of a mile away, dead. They were holding hands, even as corpses. Their families were upset, but could not blame town sweets for the act of a vicious god. The dog later died of a bowel obstruction. By this point, two weeks had passed, and the management had given up hope of finding the decrepit woman from permanent care. Every day, they waited for the call from a concerned family member, a furious visitor looking for their grandmother. After two weeks, no such scene had occurred. After two months, the management stopped worrying. After a year, everyone forgot the vegetating woman. Yet, even as all memory of the woman vanished, her doll was not forgotten. One night, a nurse had a dream about the ratty doll. Hair chewed off, clothes filthy with dry slobber and food mash. She dreamt her daughter found it, called it Baby. She thought nothing of it. The next day, the latest occupant of the woman's austere bedroom called the nurse inside. The doll was on her bed, propped up like it was watching the TV, which played static. In a month, the new occupant was bedridden, senseless, and clutching the doll. The forgotten body was never found.